Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, oh, this is, I'll try to make this a quite light-hearted presentation. It's the end of the day, you know, end of the two days. I'm sure you're all pretty much like, oh, I'll just want to get through it. Um, so, Failing with Style with your host, Alex, or Leeks, you know, as in the vegetable, or you've got problems with water coming out of pipes. So, um, I'm from Webscope in Auckland, New Zealand. We're a sort of small Drupal shop, but we like to do things a bit differently. Um, down under, I mean, we're down under here, but even further down under in New Zealand, you know, we're even further behind the curve, so we're quite, you know, <laughs> quite proud of the fact that we do automated testing and we have a continuous integration set up because a lot of the shops down there don't have that and don't do that sort of thing. Um, I've been developing with Drupal for about four years and been a developer in general for about five. I'm reasonably self-taught, so I'm not super confident about my abilities and um, I suffer from a bit of imposter syndrome. Does anyone know what imposter syndrome is? <laughs> All right, cool. Okay, so if I wasn't here, I'd rather be at, um, I think it's Horn Cologne's talk. Um, and if I couldn't be there, I'd rather be at the MIT Bitcoin Expo. So it's happening right now. It's just going to go. All right. So just to start this off, CI is a pretty big topic, and it differs a lot from project to project. So I just want to say that this is not a talk about behavior-driven development or acceptance, acceptance testing. Um, we do use acceptance testing at, at the heart of our CI implementation. And um, it's not really so much about why we've chosen certain software and things like that. It's more about really practical about how, how we've actually done it. Um, so yeah, a bit of AMA after the presentation, but might, there probably won't be very much time because it's a big topic. So i um, just like to thank basically these people because you, know, you never get to where you are without anyone in this world and I think it's important to reflect and look back on those people. So Shane Sabine gave me my first job at Jiminy, Dave Wood second at CodaWeb and I now work for WebScope. Um, Michael Kodinko is a developer at WebScope and he put most of this stuff together. So most of this kudos goes to him. And I'd like to thank Bevan Rudge and the Auckland Drupal Meetup Group who helped polish this presentation a little bit. All right, so tell you a little story about um, you know, experience that probably most of the developers here can relate to. Um, I was thrown into a project you know, on, a, on a Friday, um, and I had to fix up this you know, web form that was for entering a competition, and that was going to be launched at 12 o'clock the next day. I didn't really know too much about this, but it was quite a complex thing. It sort of had auto-saving and Ajax involved. Um, basically, I had sort of done what I thought I was doing, and I was doing it right, and I got to the afternoon, and I sort of, boss came along, you know, how's it going? And, I, you know, it's going, it's going really well, it's going sweet. So I thought, and so I gave him a link to this form, and he went, went in and started testing it, and he comes back, and he's like, ah, oh, you know, this isn't working quite right. And I'm like, ah, oh, really? It's strange, because, you know, I just wrote that code this morning, and it was working sweet. Um, it turns out, you know, I'd, I'd introduced a bug, later on that it you know, caused this feature I'd written earlier to break. And subsequently, I then had to spend quite a lot of time going back over and fixing up quite a lot of my code because I'd written it based on the fact that this was working. I, you know, I think I had some issues with jQuery and I had to change the version and that stuffed up quite a lot of other things. But anyway, I got it done you know, with a couple of hours to spare by the next day and all was well. But you know, the, the general theme there was that if I had have had a way to identify that bug earlier, you know, like within an hour after it was introduced, then I could have quickly gone back and fixed that. And bugs in programming are inevitable. You know, say the first quote here, if, if debugging is the process of removing bugs, then pro programming must be the process of, of creating them or putting them in. Um, so software is written by humans, and therefore it has bugs. You know, I don't think there's anyone out there who's writing any software without bugs unless it's a one-liner. So if you, if you can spend the time and find and fix all the bugs in your project, then you, you can't complete the project in your lifetime. Uh, even the biggest software projects in the world that have been out on the web and are crucial to security and things like that have bugs, and they're not discovered for years and years and years. I think the average is about five years for some security bugs that have been, well, Sorry, I, I read an article that was talking about some bugs in curl and things like that, and some of these bugs that existed out in the wild for five years before they'd been found. That was the average time. 
So even the biggest projects have bugs. So they're inevitable and we just need to catch them. And if we can catch them, I think we can save ourselves a lot of time and a lot of ha hassle. Okay, so just a little bit about you guys. Um, who has used VirtualBox or VMware or some sort of solution? Okay, cool. It's about 95% of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who's tied that up with Vagrant? Cool. About 85%, maybe a bit less. Okay, and so who has used the provisioning tool like Chef, Puppet, or Ansible? Okay, that's about right, maybe about 45% of you. Um, and who's tied in a testing framework, acceptance testing like BHAT or Codeception? Oh, jeez. Yeah, I think my numbers are a bit off here now. <laughs> I was a bit ambitious on that one. I'd seen some of the earlier talks and I'd tweak these numbers a little bit. It was quite ambitious. It seemed to be quite an onto it crowd around here. Um, and has anyone used sort of a CI tool like Jenkins or Travis or Hudson? Ah, cool. That's a few more than have done testing, so that's great. Or acceptance testing at least. Um, yeah, so moving on to the very high level, the highest level part of this talk. So what is CI? So if you're like me, you want to know about something, go straight to Wikipedia. Continuous integration is the practice in software engineering of merging all developer working copies with a shared mainline several times a day. Um, so to break that down in my words, um, basically means you can take all of your working code and you can merge it together into a production form essentially at any time that you want. Uh, in Wikipedia they say you could do this several times a day but they're kind of just hitting at the point that you should be able to do it any time that you want. Um, and at WebScope, because you know, every CI implementation is different, we're getting a bit more specific and in, into what this example is about. Um, in our Drupal specific example, it means that we take all the code that's ready and merge it into production form, which involves using the real data. So we've got latest code base and we get the database and the files from the live website and pull them in with the latest code. And then we build a new version of the website and we run a set of acceptance tests over that version of the website. Okay. I think I wanted to mention Michael Goddick's talk earlier, which was really great on continuous deployment, and that was a much a solution that's a much further down the line than what I'm going to introduce today. So this is much more lightweight than that, and hopefully it's practical and lightweight enough that you can take something from it and, and use it and start to implement it. So just really quickly, this is a bit of a why, but it's really high level. So Benefits of running CI, you're going to find those bugs real quick. Um, you can test at volume. You know, if, you, if you're just running your tests locally, you're probably having to wait for them to finish, and that's causing you, you know, that's costing time, and you don't want to do that. If you can dispatch that off to a build server, then you can do it as many times as you want, and you can do it over and over and over again. You can do it many more times than you could possibly ever do it on your local machine. Um, and probably the most important thing about CI and about automated testing is that you feel empowered when you're writing the code instead of feeling scared that you're going to break something. So you, I'm sure many of you have had a situation where you come onto a project that's been developed either by someone else or maybe even by you but a long time ago and you're not really sure about even what, what this website is supposed to be doing, let alone what, you know, if it's broken or not when it, when it does break. So if you do have acceptance testing, and, ex and the acceptance testing isn't really necessarily part of CI. You can do acceptance testing without CI, but CI is kind of pointless without the testing component, whether that's functional testing or acceptance testing. Um, this example only covers acceptance testing because that's what we do at WebScope. Um, but yeah, if, if, you, if you have acceptance tests in place, they can tell you a lot about the functionality of the website and what, what it's expected to do. And of course, they're there so you can run them and if they fail, you know that you've broken something. I mean, there's a whole other discussion about test coverage and how, many of the, how much of the functionality is covered, but there's a lot of things in this talk that can get really complicated really quickly and uh, you know, can be debated, so we're just going to skip over most of that. Um, and another really positive aspect of it is that you can relax as a developer. You can feel a lot less worried about what you're doing. It's better for your health. And that 
goes through to you know your bosses, your managers, and your clients as well. Everyone can feel a bit more relaxed if they know that they've got a nice CI process in place. Okay, so here's my wonderful graphic about our CI process, uh, WebScope. So it's made up of quite a few different systems, and they can be complex, but we use them in a very simple way. And I'm certain that your average developer can understand every part of the system. So don't be afraid at all if you, you, know, if you think, oh, no, this is going to be too much for me. Um, and just put your hand up if you have any questions, of course. So step one of this CI process that we have is pretty standard. We've got a developer who's obviously pretty smart. He's been working away, he's been writing some code, and he's written some really nice code, and he's written some tests for it, and he knows the tests are passing, and so now he's you know, having a much-deserved rest there, as we all, we all deserve after we've written some, written some good code. And then he pushes it up to the repository. So this part you're probably all pretty familiar with as well. You, know, you write code, branch, feature branch using dev, git flow or whatever, and you push it through to the central repository. So in our case, we use Bitbucket for that. Um, and the central repository is then monitored by the Jenkins Continuous Integration Tool. So Jenkins is, it's a bit complicated, I guess, but Jenkins is going and checking the Bitbucket repositories repository to see if there's been any changes since it last saw them. And I think it does this periodically, but you can also set up a webhook from Bitbucket to just say to Jenkins, hey, something's changed, and you can pick up on those changes much faster and, and have a build, build running you know, sooner rather than 10 minutes later or 20 minutes later. It can run straight away. And so what Jenkins does is when he does notice a change in the repository, as he basically just executes an SSH or SSHs into the boot server and executes a script. And that it then monitors that script, or Jenkins then monitors that script and sees all the output from it. And at the end, the script exits with you know, a zero or some other exit code, a zero indicating uh, a pass and another exit code um, indicating a failure. And then Jenkins does some cool reporting things and you can get it to do whatever you want. In our example, we receive an email about the build and we also have an integration with our chat system. All right. Sorry. Yeah. And he wrote the tests. That's right. So is that a separate, should he have uh, uploaded the tests to the build server? Okay, so the tests are all in the repository as well. They're committed when you commit the code oh, okay. in, in our setup here. Okay. And I, I'll show you that soon. Sorry, the yeah, question hey. here is probably also the branches. So if you multiple branches would have, you would have to have separate instances, right? That's right, yeah. Are you going to talk about that? I will talk a little bit about that, yeah. So... All right, I think step one, everyone's going to understand this. Does anyone not understand? I know this is a really bad thing to do, but raise your hand if you, if you don't know about writing code and pushing it to a central repository. You know, okay, sweet. I'm sure everyone knew that, so that's sweet. Um, okay, step two, post commit hook. So like I said, this isn't really necessary because Jenkins does, the Jenkins plugin for Bitbucket and Git does monitor the Bitbucket repository, and after some time, we'll detect that a change has been made and start a new build. But the webhook from Bitbucket just lets Jenkins know that something's changed right now and just take a look and see if it's time to start a new build. Okay. Ooh, what's that? Start some CI if you have internets. Okay. So, I think I'm in full screen mode here. Can I, so can I exit that at all? Or can I just bring it? My editor. Oh, sweet. Okay, so here I have a simple test. I'm sorry, not a simple test. I have a, I have an acceptance test um, from Codeception. Oh, you can't see this. So, sorry, guys. I thought that was on the screen. Uh, and if is anyone familiar with Codeception at all? All right, a couple of you a little bit. Um, Codeception is kind of like a testing framework for PHP and it can do functional testing and it can do unit testing and it's a bit of a wrapper around Selenium, basically, for the unit for the acceptance testing side of things. So it's 
kind of uses this Gherkin format. Um, and we won't, I won't get into the merits of why it's good, but it really works for us, and I do recommend it as a, as a great testing framework. And Other languages other than PHP, or is it all PHP? Uh, we use only PHP, yeah. Are we like oh, yeah, Codeception's PHP-based testing framework only, so. All right, so here I am inside a web root, so I'm sure you'll recognize something like that. That's a Drupal web root, and our codeception tests all live within this test folder, and that's where I am at the moment. So this is the normal structure of the codeception directory when you have it on the server, and this is the high-level part, and the main things here are the codeception YAML file is your configuration file, and if you want to look at that real quick, pretty simple. Um, I'll just say that this tests directory is available on GitHub for you to download afterwards, so you can download that, stick it into your Drupal site, and you'll need to configure, you only really need to configure the URL that it's pointing to, so that's just your local development URL, and then you might have to create the logs directory and make sure that it's writable. But there, there will be, a, there isn't a readme there on, on that now, but I will make a readme up on the GitHub repo for that. Sorry, I just wanted to use Python JS, so that means you don't have a separate Selenium box with the actual Chromium or something running, yeah? That's right, that's right. So we use Phantom JS, which is a, like a fully fledged sort of headless browser. It does CSS, it does JavaScript, it does everything that, that we need it to do. It's quite powerful. I highly recommend that as well. Can um, Can yes, and it makes screenshots. <laughs> it does. Okay, so I'm going to run a test now, and I'm going to run this test that you can see here. So this is a basic codeception test, hello world, Gherkin, this, this, these lines don't do anything, they just output for humans, and then this is a really simple test. I'm on page slash, I'm on the home page, and I can see the element, and that's a CSS selector. Okay, so I'll run this test. And it's as simple as this, so one acceptance test is run. This is some of the human stuff that you see. I'm going to check the site is loading as an anonymous user. I'm on the home page, and I see the element skip link, and you can see that test is passed. Another little thing here is resizing the window. That's just a function that's called beforehand, using the before syntax in the, in the function comment. So that just resizes the window to something appropriate. So you can use Codeception if you want to test mobile, size it down to a smaller window and test to see if this or, this or that element's visible in that particular view. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll start an actual CI build process. So I have some files that I stuck in the commit. They're not really relevant. And I'll, when I, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to commit these files and I'm going to push them. And so Hopefully you all understand from the graphic earlier that when we push the files up, Bitbucket hook is saying to Jenkins, hey, um, there's something going on here, and maybe right now Jenkins is logging into Bitbucket to see what is happening and if, if there's some, some builds that need to be run, and it should find that there are some builds that need to be run, and it should start running those builds. Okay, so we'll just we'll go back to that in a bit. Hopefully, it will work. Um, I'm not really sure about the internet in this setup. So, after you've done with Jenkins, what he does is he checks Bitbucket, and after he's checked Bitbucket, he runs this simple command. So it's just the SSH command. It SS, SSH is into our build server, and it runs the site build.sh script, and it passes in some parameters. So it passes in the branch name, the build number and the site name. And I'll show you that now. I don't know, sorry, my slides has come onto the other screen here, but I'll, all right, you can see that. So this is the, the main backend of Jenkins, and these are, are the projects that we have set up at the moment. And on here, you've got some sunshine and clouds indicating if builds have been passing or failing, information about successes and failures. And I'll go into the config, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> So I'll go into the configuration for this. Again, this is all quite simple stuff. I don't think there's anything that's going to be confusing in here for you guys. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not the smartest developer in the world, and I can understand it. So, um, 
And so some of the things in here, we don't use all of this configuration. I'm just going to tell you about what I know about. Um, project name, description, that stuff's pretty self-explanatory. I don't know about discard old builds, but you can imagine, I'm not sure why it's ticked either, but I can, you can imagine that's to go through and delete old builds that you're not using anymore. Um, this is pretty important, your public key. So you need to put that on your build server so that Jenkins can go in and actually execute those SSH commands. Um, we have the Slack plugin for Jenkins for a Slack chat. Does anyone use Slack chat? Cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you can get, um, you know, FlowDoc or hip chat integrations and everything as well. So put in the channel that we're posting to and the situations that we need to be notified. So build start, we just get everything here. I don't think we actually have things like aborted builds and not built builds and unstable builds. Those are more complex functionality that we, we don't use yet, we don't identify with. Um, so source code management, this is where the Bitbucket stuff happens. We have a Bitbucket plugin for Jenkins. This stuff's all pretty easy to set up. And I, I'm going to provide code samples for all of this stuff, but the Jenkins service I can't because this is a hosted service that we use at CloudBees. So it's, it, it, hopefully this will be enough to give you an idea of how to set that up. And you just install the, the Bitbucket plugin, I believe, and Git if you want it, that GitHub. So yeah, we put in the repository URL, Drupal South, and then some credentials so that Jenkins can log into Bitbucket and check to see if there's any changes that have been made. And then we tell it which branch to look at. So we're looking at Sprint 1 branch in this case. Um, build triggers, build when a change is pushed to Bitbucket. So any trigger we've got. And here's the script that you saw on the last slide. So that's the command that Jenkins is going to run given that this has been the branch that has been changed on this repository. So yeah, just oh, there's really only two bits of information here, just the repo on the branch that you're putting in. Um, the site name is another bit of information, and there's a configuration file on the build server which has a lot more information about that particular site. And I, again, that code is all available as well. Um, I've actually put the link to the slideshow and the links to the code examples up on the Drupal South web page for this talk. So if you want that, just go there and you can see it all. Um, so down the bottom here, you've got the post build actions, um, simple email notification here, and Slack notifications, which you saw was configured up top. OK, so now we're going to see if Jenkins has actually been running a build. And <laughs> This, this cloud B service is a little bit like kind of unreliable at automatically picking up the builds. It does it about 85 to 90 percent of the time, and then other times it just I don't know what it's doing. Um, so last failure is four minutes, 22 seconds ago. I think that that sounds like our build. So if I click on this build and go through to the console output, I can see what Jenkins saw when I ran the build um, on the server. And, oh great, I've got an error that I didn't have before. Uh, looks like there's an authentication problem, not only have I not had it before, I've never had it. Nah. Okay, that's a bit dumb, but that's okay anyway. Um, we can still move on without that. Essentially what it does here is it goes through and Oh, we'll move on to the next slide, which is going to help explain that. So, All right, so this is the script that is called by Jenkins on the build server to trigger the build and run the whole build and then return an exit code to Jenkins, which is determining the pass or the fail of the build. So at the top here, we can see that we've got some parameters coming in that we, that we passed to the script, a bit of an echo, some information. And then we change into this directory where there's a bunch of files and directories that are expected. And then we run um, an Ansible script to do a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm not going to get into Ansible here, except to say that it's really awesome. And it's basically like a bash script, a big long bash script, if, if you want to have a simple idea of what it is in your head. So it's, it's doing a bunch of stuff there. And what it's doing is it's, you know, it's taking the latest code from Bitbucket, it's taking the database from live, it's taking the files from live, it's marrying it all together and it's creating a whole new, a new website, a new virtual host and everything like that. 
Okay, so once it's done all that, we change into the newly created directory. So we can see we're passing in those arguments into this directory name and changing into that directory. And then we're changing straight into the test directory. Um, some of the stuff's comment, I'll talk about that if there's time. And then what we do down the bottom is this is where the magic happens. We run the coexception command to run all of the acceptance tests that are on that website. So it just goes through, finds all the tests, and just runs them all one after another. And if any one of them fails, it's going to return um, an exit code of greater than zero, and the build will be considered a failure. We don't have a setup yet where we get information about how many of the tests have passed or failed, which is unfortunate because that granularity would you know, obviously help and be beneficial. Well, that's probably the next step for us, actually. We do have a code coverage tool, but I'm not going to talk about that at the moment. So I've actually just remembered I should, I should have some builds from earlier that I, that I tried out and that should still be here. So this is one of the, you know, the benefits of all of this. So. so these are the old builds that I've kind of been running up into, up in preparation for this. And this should be the same build that I was running that failed, basically. So yeah, this is um, some stuff that happens before. All of this task stuff, that's all the Ansible script running. So some of the stuff should make, pretty much make sense if you were automating the setup of a new site. So we're pulling code, creating settings files, HT access, creating databases, downloading the databases. We host with Pantheon, and they have some nice Drush tools to go in and grab the latest copy of the database and the files for us. Um, unpacking, renaming, file permissions, um, Registry rebuild, if you've moved module folders around, maybe you've moved it from a contract folder into a patched folder, or you've just organized your modules, you need to rebuild the registry, otherwise you're going to have a really bad time. And other things like updb, features revert all, flush all caches. These are all things that you kind of need to have implemented to make sure that your, builds, your site build is going to make it through to the end, no matter what changes that you've made. Um, and then so down here, simple output. Very There's that coexception output that you'll be familiar with. From here, very similar. And down the bottom there, you can see that the finish was a failure. All right, so the, the test that failed here was Hello World Test, which is interesting because I thought that it would have been this one that failed. But... Anyway, we'll get back to where the magic happens. Is there anyone that's sort of confused about any of the parts of this process at all? Um, you know how you said you use Pantheon? So are you using the Pantheon development environment to run your tests on, or do you have your own? So we have our own build server for running all of our CI stuff. Basically, yeah. And it's probably more expensive to do that as well. Oh, D-Man. Um, how many servers do you, are involved in this process? It seems like there's a lot of moving parts. Um, are there, yeah, how many so we have, we have Pantheon, which is our hosting. And then we have Jenkins, which is a hosted service that we pay for. And then we have our build server. Do you have the GitHub repository? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, GitHub repository. And, and there's your client there. You, you've got five machines talking to each other, right? Yeah. It's the future. Except for Jenkins, do you have another nice new UI for you guys to just to track all that stuff? No. Um, no, we don't. And the second, well, the second question would be, do you, how do you configure the projects for different clients? Because this is like, with, you know, just for, for this specific case, we had a separate Jenkins job. That's yeah. right. So we just sort of just set up a new configuration with basically the same parameters for that. And so back to your question earlier about you know, having different branches, you can set up Jenkins. And as you saw in the example, we put the branch in there that we want to build. I think there's a bug with the Jenkins plugin for Bitbucket, and it can't, doesn't pass through the branch. So we can't just build every branch that comes through. Otherwise, we could set that up. But it's not too much of a loss. Usually, we just want to build something specific anyway. Is it actually useful to do it on every push, or do you want to do like ad hoc um, running or or a cron run like 7 a.m. 5 a.m. Yeah, so, so, so your master branch is always uh, passing. 
Yeah, we don't do that sort of traditional software sort of based continuous integration. We've got a bunch of people working and working and we just need to want to build like a couple of times per day. We do build on every commit and I mean, is it useful? Well, it's, it's not really detrimental. It doesn't really matter if there's a new build for every commit. And yeah, I guess in that case, it is useful. You might see a failure earlier, but if you're just doing like a bunch of small features and it's, you're doing like five features over the course of an hour, you might just put those all into one commit and do one push rather than push, 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 and then you'll get five builds, which, to be honest, it doesn't even matter. Like, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so, yeah, there is a bit of a nicer interface, I suppose you could say, but it's not, an, it's not a software application, so to speak. It's just Slack chat. <laughs> and so we, we get notifications via email and by Slack chat, and of course you can set Jenkins up with all sort of, sorts of integrations to send the data where you want. And another, another part of the feedback cycle is that, you know, it's building a whole website, so we actually have that website, and we can then log into that website, and we can see firsthand what has happened with that build. Um, a great benefit for that, another great benefit is that, is that we can sort of pass that off to a client. If a client wants to see, you know, where's, you know, where's the latest set of work at, we just send them a link to this build server and away they go. I'll, I'll, build, so I'll see if I can find that. So I'm getting confused by this double desktop thing and I'm not really sure where all of those tabs are going. They're down here. No? Okay. All right, so here's Slack chat over here, and this is the failing with style channel that I've set up. And so you can see that this is um, Bitbucket bot. We've got that set up to talk into Slack chat as well. So it's saying that there's a new commit, and this is the commit message, failed build and this is who's done it, and then down here, Jenkins bot coming in and telling us that it started a build with these changes by this person, and then the build failed um, after one minute and 22 seconds of running. That's a pretty short build. Sometimes if you get a lot of tests and a lot of functionality, the build can last quite a bit longer. And it's quite hard to speed that process up with acceptance testing because it's going, you know, as a human would, through all the pages and clicking on these things, so it's subject to load times and things like that. Whereas for functional testing, you can maybe do some tricks to really speed up the running of your tests. So somewhere in here, and this isn't the friendliest way, but there's a URL to the actual build. And in the meantime, I'll see if I can sneak in here, and I'll see if I can. So here's a bit of a more complex test, hello contact form. Um, I'm on the slash contact page. I see contact web scope. Uh, fill in a couple of fields. Click submit, um, which is field is required. If I run that test here, you can see that this is failing. Okay, so this is the actual website that it was just at my local site, and if we go to the contact form, you'll see that the name, email, and the message field isn't required. So if you fill these out and click submit, you will be able to submit this form. But one of the requirements here is that you know, the message field is filled out. This is a really simple example. It's probably not a test that you would ever write unless it was absolutely critical that this form had a required field. Um, so if I come in here and I check this, and then I run this again, Sweet. Okay, so it's passed, as you expect. And so if we come into Codeception here, oh, that's not the right window. Oh, PHP Storm, sorry. Um, we can go into the log folder, and we can see a bunch of screenshots. That's pretty cool. So if a, if a Test fails. Um, this is local stuff, and it is a, this information is also available on the build server. But when a build or when a test fails, you can get a screenshot of why that failure would be. So in this case, it failed because it was expecting to see 
the messages required field and instead the form has been submitted successfully. Um, they're pretty much all like that, I think. <laughs> but I can show you um, a better example of that if there's time. So yeah, hopefully you guys can see how that's quite beneficial to be doing the automated testing and then also having the build available to send off to the client or you know to a manager if they want to go and do some manual testing and stuff like that. They don't really have to bother you even. Like my, my bosses are you know quite, they're not super technically savvy but they, they know about this and they know how to go into Jenkins and they can find the latest build and they can just go and check it themselves without even asking. I'll see. Um, we also have this little script to basically read from the test folder a file and generate this output of all the tests. So there'll be an entry here for each test. There's only a couple here um, that f um, pass, so there's nothing. And then if it does fail, it has a read failure message and it pulls through the screenshot. So yeah, that's, um, that's pretty cool. And I'll just show you, oh, actually, I'll, I'll just get on with it so, so we don't miss out on anything. So do it yourself. These links are all on the um, Drupal South page for this talk, so you can go in and get links to them. Um, I'll just explain them really quickly. I've sort of talked about that Coatception's example directory, so that's the slash tests directory that you'll put in your Drupal root. And then, so Ansible local setup, this, this repo is a set, the setup that we use every day. All of the developers at WebScope use this setup, so it's a uh, Vagrant and Ansible set up and it's going to provision a virtual machine on your computer and it's going to provision, you know, Apache, PHP, MySQL and it's going to provision Codeception and, you know, a, a bunch of other stuff as well that, that we use. So you might want to take some stuff out but it, the key thing is it does have Codeception in there so you shouldn't really have to do much setup if, you, if you're using this virtual box. Um, the build server, so the build server that all these tests are run on, we configure the whole thing through an Ansible script. You know, we don't go and log in and change things and change things. Everything that's changed on the boot server is changed through Ansible and then the Ansible scripts are rerun to configure the boot server again. You know, that way if we needed another boot server, we just bring it up and we just run the Ansible script and bam, we have another boot server. So if you want to do that, you just need to take that script. I think we host on Rackspace for our boot server, so not that that really matters. Um, and then the site build Ansible script and then the whole setup really. So this is a script that lives on the build server and is run locally on the server to create the new copies of the website. So that's, this, that's the directory and the associated files that is triggered by Jenkins to do basically all of the magic. Um, yeah, okay, so that's kind of the end of it and I'm a little bit early, but I'm sure that there's maybe a lot of questions and I've got a lot of other stuff I can keep showing you guys if, if you want. I mean, Ansible is really awesome, so I can, I can talk about that all day. Um, some of this stuff just, yeah, so there's some resources at the end of this slide a little bit, you know, about alternatives to Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt. Um, Ansible is a lot simpler than these alternatives if you're just doing sort of day-to-day -day DevOps works, work on like medium size, large size sites. It's not really sort of your enterprise level solution, but it's, it's so much easier to understand. I spent a lot of time trying to get to know Puppet and I kind of got there, but in the end I felt like it wasn't really worth it for my situation. But Ansible, you can almost understand straight away. So I highly recommend using Ansible for your configuration management. And with CloudBees and Jenkins, there are some other hosted services for that, I think. We use CloudBees, there's like Jenkins hosting, and there's Bitnami, and there's a bunch of other CI hosting things that have kind of actually moved a step on from this, and they sort of provide Jenkins integrated with the actual build server as well. And a lot of people are doing that a lot of different ways, and these are all online services you might use instead of Jenkins, and they may be even better. Maybe there's something that we'll look to move to in the future as well. Um, and yeah, like I said, they incorporate everything and they can run builds in parallel and run all your tests in parallel and things as well. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening in that um, CI space. Right, so I might walk through 
this is the site built script that sets up a new website on the built server. So there's a bit of a readme there about how to set that up on the server. Of course, if you, if you have any trouble with that, feel free to you know, come into issue queue, post an issue. If you're going to fix something, make a pull request, please. And so here's the site built script. I don't really talk about that very much because I've already seen it. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, this little thing down here, this Coexception command that was commented out, takes the tests and puts them into an XML file. And then that XML file is used to generate this output that you see here. So that's kind of cool. If you want, if you want that functionality, just comment that out. Um, to the guts of it, in the playbooks folder, in the build folder, build directory folder, um, this is the configuration for an individual site. So whenever you start development on a new site, you need to pull this repo, you need to copy this example file, change some parameters, and then push it back up to the build server. So as we saw with Jenkins, he only passes like a little bit of information through, and one of those, one of those things is the site name. So that's, there's a lot of configuration already on the build server, which is going to be triggered by that particular parameter. Okay, so this, and this, will, this part will change a little bit for your setup. So we have a thing, a UUID here for our Pantheon environment, and you would have to change the script a little bit to work with whatever hosting environment you were working with to be able to get, somehow get those database and files folders down. But essentially, we sort of configure it, put in the GitHub repository, we put in the UUID, some parameters about where the site will be built. You shouldn't have to change any of those things. The only things that you, you really would have to modify is to change the script to get those, that database and those files. And so you would modify those, those settings. This is the settings file for the Ansible playbooks that runs. So playbooks, the sort of the word for, term for an Ansible script. And, and we might as well start to go over that real quick. Um, well, there's one minute left. Is there any questions? I think I've probably gone over most of it. I'm interested to know when you when or what you use to trigger getting rid of the tested site. Okay, so we destroy the playbook and then it works. Yeah, yeah. So we use um you're not gonna be very satisfied with this answer, but we use this guy here. <laughs> <laughs> he goes in there and he does something to remove them. I think he I think that there is a script to run. I'm not sure how complete that, that destroy script is. Um, but he knows how to go in and manually remove those builds. Um, with the site. There is a site destroy script in the root of this repo, but like I said, I destroy all sites, site destroy. I'm not sure if this is what he actually uses to destroy it, so use that at your own risk. Um, Just a question around the timing on the large website. Like, do you have any large clients with databases like all the one view? Um, no, no, we don't. Okay, what, is the, what is the longest time that it took to pull the database from the... You know, from the Pantheon? Database? Yeah, I mean, Pantheon's on rack space. Our boot server's on rack space. They probably have like a gigabyte link or more, so I, it maybe takes, you know, a couple of minutes. It's so never you noticeable. Just rush to, like, aliases, you just pull it somehow? That's right. Um, Pantheon has a drush command, set of commands called Terminus and they allow you to sort of log on and grab it in a, in a friendly way. But otherwise, you could just use aliases would be a perfect setup for that, no matter where you are. You can just get a SQL dump of the database and the files, you know. It's totally usable. Yeah. Ah, yeah, so time, all right. Okay, everyone needs to head over to the auditorium now for the closing ceremony. There's no break between now and then, so head over there ASAP. And thanks for coming. Thank you, thank you.